Welcome back everybody. As many of you know, the popular Islamic historical narrative that Muslims have been taught for centuries is now being called into serious question and has been for the last several decades. Of course, Dan Gibson's beautifully illustrated early Islamic Qiblis is a good example of that as well as his book Quranic Geography. Some of that information is online and I want to take a look at just a small sampling of it, just the part that's relevant to us in this video. Now, Gibson's work, of course, consists of plotting the Qiblas of mosques that he's been able to visit. And if we go up to Petra, we can filter our results, and then we can look at the dates over here. And we can see that the early mosques faced Petra. So this is why Gibson believes that the early holy city in Islam was in fact Petra. It's actually one of many reasons, and he highlights those in his written work, which is widely available also on YouTube, and then he has a couple of websites as well. So we don't need to um, address his work anymore other than to focus on that one important detail for this video. And that is, once again, that we see these early mosques facing Petra, but we can actually go filter to the Abbasid period and we can see that things look much different. So this is why Gibson says in his published work, uh, this is page 172 of Early Islamic Kiblis, he says, After 252 AH, which is 866 CE, Mecca became the sole Qibla used by the Abbasids and the other Qiblas fade from view. So with the change in power, uh, that occurred when the Abbasids took over, came a demographic shift, came a uh, geographical shift as well, and a religious shift from the northern holy city of Petra down to Mecca. Now, how does this relate to Muhammad's skin color? You may be thinking, what is the connection? Well, let's find out. As many of you know, and we'll read some of these sources later, Muhammad was white. He was very, very white. However, in the Islamic tradition, there is some contrast. Dr. Wesley Williams refers to Ibn Sa'd's work where he cites three reports explicitly attributing a black or dark black complexion to Muhammad. Three of them are a blemish-free black complexion with a sheen, i.e. golden brown. Four of them are luminous, and six are attributing a white complexion. Ibn Sa'd makes no attempt to reconcile these contrasting images. Now, the primitive devotion that Dr. Williams is talking about is perhaps the best explanation for why accounts like this keep all of these contradictory reports. Okay, the, the history of primitive devotion is that the author is so enamored with the subject that he's writing about or compiling traditions about that he doesn't want to throw anything away. All right, keep it all. And so that's how you get all of these conflicting traditions. Dr. Wesley says around the 9th to 10th century coincides with the period during which the prophet's biography was subjected to critical assessment and pruned of its objectionable or heretical materials, in some reconstructed. That's his emphasis. The divergent material is specifically addressed, and that material that distracts from the grandiose image of the prophet as the community imagined it at the time is excluded. So we get a reconstituted Sira with a reconstructed image of Muhammad. Now about the time that this image of Muhammad is being reconstructed, we have the infamous fatwa. Anyone who says the prophet is black should be killed. The prophet, of course, was not black, and saying so disparages him and attributes to him what does not befit him. So how do we make sense of what's going on here? We have a lot going on. The Abbasids have just taken over and a lot's changing in the Islamic world. Muhammad's biography is being reconstructed. The imagination of Muslims is being realized in these writings, making Muhammad conform to what they wanted him to be. We also have some racial tension as well as reflected in this fatwa about calling Muhammad black. Well, let's go a little further and see what's going on. The preponderant element of the revolution that toppled the Umayyads was the Iranian masses who were resentful of both the Arabs putting an end to 1100 years of Persian civilization and the Arab racial arrogance and the discrimination that followed. Abbasid culture was profoundly shaped by Persian such that it can be said that Persian civilization would rebound, mutatis mutandis, its Islamicization. Slowly, almost stealthily, 
in less than a century. In the process, ethnic Arabs became less and less observable, not only in administration but in all fields, including the religious sciences. This is a really important statement. Iranian scholars would become some of the chief fashioners of Islamic tradition and were instrumental, in fact, in creating a new Arab identity. So Dr. Williams is going to argue that the Arab identity was shaped retroactively by the Abbasids, i.e. Persians, and then forced back onto the early Muslims. So these descriptions of Muhammad, where do they come from? You know, the ones that we hear today. You know the ones I'm talking about. I saw a man of striking appearance, radiant face. His belly wasn't protruding, nor was his head disproportionate and small. Proportionate and delicate, finely made, a specimen of a creation. In his eyes there was a contrast. The dark was immensely dark. The white was excessively white and his eyelashes were long and in his voice was a natural echo and his neck was elegantly long. His eyebrows were arced but they were not joint. It was separated. You can't make this stuff up. I, I, I guess you can. Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was sewing with the needle, my needle dropped in the dark, I couldn't find it. I said, Ya Rasul, I can't find it. He moved his face close and I swear, bout of the radiance of his face, I found my needle. So where do these descriptions come from? Well, we have a theory. There was a second century stereotype of a man who loves scholarship. He was well proportioned, straight figured, ruddy white complexion, wavy reddish brown hair, smooth and not curly or thick. William says this Hellenistic physiognomy tradition influenced popular Islamic physiognomy traditions. So we can compare this with Termidy. He was uh, well proportioned according to the second century stereotype. And of course, Muhammad was neither extremely tall nor extremely short. He was of medium height. Um, his hair was uh, neither curly nor completely straight, rather in between. And here we have wavy reddish brown hair and not curly or thick. And of course, he was ruddy white. And up here we have a ruddy white complexion. Sounds strangely familiar, doesn't it? Let's look at a couple of examples from the Hadith. The man came to a mosque looking for Muhammad. And of course, Muhammad was the white man. The Messenger of Allah had the whiteness of his belly exposed. Hmm. Of course, Muhammad also had a white mule. Here's a man who looked like Muhammad. And of course, he was white. And Muhammad even had a white standard. We could go on and on with these types of references. Here's another example, uh, the famous story of the Meccan Arabs and the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius. When he pulled out a black silk cloth with a white figure, the Arabs weep, for they realized that it was Muhammad. However, this was a result of the Persian influence. While testimony to a fair-skinned Muhammad is found there, i.e. classical sources, this is no doubt a secondary development that was impacted by a profound shift in the demographic balance of power in the Muslim world that followed the Abbasid Revolution. The era of the Arab Empire passed with the overthrow of the Umayyads and a profoundly different era was ushered in. Now, you get an honorary PhD in skin color if you can remember what I'm about to tell you. For Dr. Williams, the whiteness of Muhammad is a secondary development. Muhammad was originally black but not too black. For Dr. Williams, the Hadith and, and these classical sources, when they say red, um, they mean white. In other words, if an Arab wanted to characterize someone with a white complexion, they would use red. Okay, black is a pure Arab. Okay, so red is white, black is pure Arab, and a fair-skinned, i.e. brown Arab, is one of noble birth and white is slave status okay so these are how these skin colors work for uh, dr williams okay black is pure arab once again brown skinned is a noble arab white is slave status and red equals white so you're going to run into these arguments sometimes when Muslims are trying to explain their way out of the racism of their religion, and that's where some of this stuff comes from. But back to Islamic history. Remember Gibson's diagram and the early mosques 
pointing to Petra. And then remember that under the influence of the Abbasids, there is a power shift, a demographic shift, and a shift in the religious center of Islam down to Mecca. And then Petra faded from memory. From a completely different perspective, and I'll leave it to you to look up the uh, credentials of Dr. Wesley Williams and uh, the affiliations and the ideologies uh, that he's associated with, and you can decide if his conclusions are driven by his ideology or by his scholarship. But with respect to the revision in Islamic history, here's an interesting thing, and I think it's significant. You have two researchers from completely different perspectives, Dan Gibson from geography and from archaeology, and then Dr. Wesley Williams. They're coming at this from completely different perspectives, and they're telling us the same thing in one significant area, and that is that there was a great revision in Islamic history around the Abbasid period. So in conclusion, Muslims wanting to know the true history of their religion have several significant challenges, and I mean this sincerely. Number one, classical Islamic texts contradict themselves. My favorite example of this is the disagreement over Isaac and Ishmael in Islamic scholarship. I've had Muslims say, even right here on this channel, that nowhere has any Muslim at any time ever said that Isaac was the son who was bound on the altar by Abraham. For Muslims, it's Ishmael. But that's simply demonstrably false. We can go to Tabri and we can see where Muhammad himself, the prophet, said, referencing the verse, that it was Isaac. But we can also see where Muhammad was asked who the victim was, and he said it was Ishmael. So we have traditions in Tabri which say that Muhammad said it was Isaac who was bound. And then we have traditions that say Muhammad said it was Ishmael. The same thing with Ibn Abbas. Reuben Firestone has actually given us a list of these in an appendix um, of his book, Journeys in the Holy Lands, and he lists the supporters of Isaac. Here they are, dozens of names. These are all Isaac, and then supporters of Ishmael. And once again, we have dozens of names ending there. So Muslim interpreters can't even agree on that. Okay, the Sources contradict themselves. Um, the same thing in Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Ibn Majah. They contradict the respective Hadith collections, but then there are contradictions within these Hadith collections themselves as well. So these are things that you have to get past as a Muslim. You have to figure out, navigate your way through them if you're trying to get some sort of an accurate picture of your history. But there are more challenges, except that popularly held beliefs about Islam's history are largely wrong. There's very little historical evidence for them and much against. The difference is substantial. That is the difference between the truth and what Muslims are traditionally taught. You have to accept that substantial revisions to Islamic history have been made, and we've talked about that. Two different researchers coming at the history of Islam from two different angles, and they're both telling us one thing. There's a major revision during the Abbasid period. Therefore, any investigation of early Islamic history, i.e. pre-Abbasid, must go behind the obscurity introduced by this major revision. Many of these changes have direct theological impact, i.e. the composition of the Quran, and I intend to produce some content on that later this year. You also have to accept, and this is a very difficult one, that the truth is more important than your traditions. Historically, some Muslims wanted Muhammad to be black. Other Muslims, like the Persians and later the Ottomans, wanted Muhammad to be white, but not too white. More of a reddish white will do. Muhammad's skin color, like his character, as the supposedly peaceful prophet of Islam, can be whatever Muslims want it to be. Islam is not based on fact. It's not based on truth, historical or otherwise. It's simply an illusion that Muslims construct and customize to suit their presuppositions about what their religion and their prophet should be. In the next video, we're going to peer back through this curtain of the obscurity of Islamic history, and we're going to try to take a look at the early origins of one of the five pillars of Islam, a pillar that many Muslims assume has been monolithic throughout history, and we'll find that's not the case. I'll see you then. Thanks for watching.